David, uh, uh, whenever you're ready, you can uh, begin to speaking about Manitoba wetland fault, the Manitoba wetland fault balancing regulation and incentives. Thanks, Ian. Um, so welcome everybody. Thanks to the PHJV for thinking of us and giving us this opportunity to present today. Um, there's been some significant shifts in Manitoba's wetland policy over the last number of years. Um, and David and I are going to kind of take you through some of those changes today. I'll be largely focusing on the background of how we got to where we got. David's going to focus on the changes that were made to the Water Rights Act and regulation, which governs drainage in Manitoba. And then I'll shift back and, and talk about the incentive side of things. Uh, so really a joint presentation today. So in Manitoba, there's a number of legislation and, and, and policies around wetlands. Um, drainage is legislated and regulated by the Water Rights Act. All drainage requires water rights uh, authorization. So whether that's a license or a registration. There are wetland drainage policies under the Water Rights Act that include the protection of class three, four, and five wetlands. There's also wetland policies within the provincial land use policies, um, which have to be considered um, in local development plans under the Planning Act. So that's the municipal planning process. In addition to that, the Water Protection Act governs the development of watershed management plans in Manitoba. Under this legislation, watershed management plans must identify issues relating to the protection, conservation, or restoration of water, aquatic ecosystems, and drinking water sources in the watershed. So specifically, um, a major issue um, in Manitoba watersheds uh, relates to wetland drainage. Watershed management plans must contain objectives, policies, and recommendations to address these types of issues. So then there's also the Watershed Districts Act and the Watershed Districts are a partnership program that uh, provide incentive based funding to implement those watershed management plans. A large focus of the work that they do is in agricultural Manitoba and focuses on wetland conservation, enhancement and restoration. The Environment Act protects larger scale wetlands. This includes modifications to lakes, rivers um, with water surface areas of two square kilometers or more. And historically, Man Manitoba dabbled a bit in the offset requirements. There were memorandums of understanding with Manitoba Hydro and Manitoba Infrastructure that required uh, offsets if their work was going to impact wetland habitat. So in 2016, our Premier released mandate letters to each department. Two of the mandate items for um, the, our form, David and I's former department um, included um, linkages with wetland policy. So the first Manitoba Sustainable Development will implement a watershed-based planning for drainage and water resource management with a goal of no net loss of water retention capacity in watersheds. And the second being Manitoba Departments of Agriculture and Sustainable Development will implement a program based on the alternate land use services model to help reduce flooding and improve water quality and nutrient management in partnership with landowners, government organizations and federal and municipal governments. So as a response to these mandate items, the Manitoba government released a comprehensive watershed based policy framework in 2017. The framework had a number of components, including the modernization of Manitoba's conservation district program and a shift to the new watershed district program. The establishment of growing outcomes in watersheds or GROW, which is Manitoba's response to that ecological goods and services program based on the Alice model and a streamlined approach to drainage and water control works that included provisions for no net loss of wetland benefits. So these have largely driven our priorities over the last number of years. 
Core principles of the watershed-based policy framework relate to legislation, um, management of infrastructure, land and watershed planning, and incentive programming. The watershed-based um, policy framework was largely based around watershed governance, plan implementation, management, and regulation. Since wetland drainage and wetland loss is signif uh, significant with issue within agro Manitoba watersheds, wetland play played a big role in the development of this policy. From 2018 to 2020, Manitoba made significant changes to regulation and incentive program programming provincially. For regulation, changes included new streamlined approach to drainage for lower class wetlands and a mitigative approach to wetland drainage for class three and above. In addition to that, the watershed, we shifted the 18 conservation districts to 14 new watershed districts based on watershed boundaries and modernized the policies surrounding them, including the addition of linkages between the watershed management planning process and the Water Rights Act. So a bit of a timeline on how we got here. So that mandate item came out in 2016. In 2017, uh, the consultation happened on the watershed-based policy framework. In addition to that, Manitoba released the Climate and Green Plan, which talked about the need for a watershed-based policy framework, including the establishment of GROW, a shift to of conservation districts to watershed districts, the importance of watershed management planning and uh, changes in regulation uh, governing drainage. In 2018, those changes were made under the Sustainable Watersheds Act uh, through or two, four different pieces of legislation. As well, in late 2018, Manitoba established the Conservation Trust which is a trust designed to provide conservation-based funding, watershed-based funding in, in Manitoba. In 2019, water rights, the water rights regulation came into force. Manitoba also established the GROW Trust, which is a trust that would uh, fund future GROW program, and GROW was launched. In 2020, the amendments to the Watershed Districts Act came into force. And uh, as well, Manitoba established a wetlands grow trust. So all of these trusts I'll talk about a bit later, but that's kind of the timeline on, on the changes that were made. So I'll shift over uh, to David to take the next few slides. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, so the Water Rights Act, as Andrea had mentioned, is the legislation that governs drainage in Manitoba. It states that no person shall control water or construct, establish, or maintain any water control works unless he or she has a valid and subsisting license to do so. So it, with the Sustainable Watersheds Act, uh, as Andrea had mentioned, it amended four pieces of legislation. Uh, the amendments as it relates to the Water Rights Act included provisions that allow for a straightforward approach to streamline the application and approval process a consistent regulatory regime for drainage and water control works, including a new provision to compensate for lost or altered wetlands through a no net loss of wetlands benefits approach. It also included a reduction and a commitment to reduce wait times as well as red tape uh, through this new registration process that we'll talk about shortly as well as a framework where water retention and drainage projects can be considered together uh, when making overall land use decisions. Next slide, please. So in October of 2019, the final regulation came into a force uh, along with proclamation of the remaining parts of the Act. Uh, some of the highlights of the uh, regulation included uh, a new approach to exempt certain works from authorizations from the department, uh, a new streamlined approach to seven types of registrable projects, a uh, streamlined approach to focus officer attention on higher risk, higher impact projects through uh, compared to the traditional licensing process, 
we added some additional flexibility to the downstream landowner sign off requirements and also included the new approach that includes compensation of seasonal wetlands and protection of more permanent wetlands through a continuation of a policy uh, that was set out to prohibit drainage unless uh, done under exceptional circumstances. So looking specifically at some of the exemptions that were outlined, um, uh, there was uh, three uh, particular types of projects that no longer require authorization under the Water Rights Act. Uh, we have same for same culvert replacements where there's no change in culvert size or invert elevation. We have a means to harmonize approvals with the Environment Act process where any drainage and water retention projects that require a license under the Environment Act uh, do not specifically require an additional uh, approval through yeah. water rights licensing authorization process. Uh, these are, are typically larger scale projects where there's a much greater uh, level of project design and review and uh, having that additional authorization is, is not required and was deemed to be uh, somewhat redundant. And finally, water control works constructed within urban areas. Uh, this is largely a formalization of the uh, current policy uh, within the department uh, where works within an urban area do not outlet to an outlying rural area or in instances where there's a proposed loss or alteration of a class three, a class four or a class five wetland. Yeah. So this new streamlined regulatory approach, and there's a couple of examples here, the registration process on the left and the licensing process on the right. Uh, the streamlined process allows for certain types of routine works to be registered with the department, uh, providing that the project proponent adheres to the regulatory standards attached with that uh, particular class. More extensive works that do not fit the defined class or do not follow the mandatory standards outlined in legislation uh, require a water control works license. So looking on the left hand side, the uh, registration process, uh, various types of routine drainage and water retention projects um, that the department would encounter have been grouped into seven classes of projects. And essentially if a project fits uh, within one of those seven identified classes and it meets the regulatory requirements for that particular class, it can move through the registration process. Uh, the project proponent would identify what is proposed to be done. Uh, they would remit a $100 application fee and the department would uh, provide the proponent with a registration certificate within 14 days at which time the project proponent would be able to uh, proceed with their project. Uh, a number of these projects uh, are selected uh, for an auditing uh, requirement uh, to ensure compliance and uh, overall ensure that regulatory standards uh, for that project class are, are met. The individual projects, the seven that I had referenced, uh, we have minor surface drain construction. Uh, so those would be agricultural drains less than 12 inches in depth. Uh, there's a category for subsurface tile drainage projects. Uh, the third one is looking at water control works for new crossings. Uh, there's a category for minor culvert changes. So looking at uh, changes to hydraulic um, capacity of less than 15 percent, category for wetland enhancement and restoration, and the last two categories are ones for small dams and one for the construction of small dry dams. On the licensing process basically is items or projects that would not meet the criteria of a registrable project and so that enables the department to focus on higher risk projects, uh, have a more uh, careful look at those projects that impact a uh, class three wetland 
And given that uh, a significant number of the projects aren't going to be scrutinized in the fashion that they were previously, that enables the department to provide shorter wait times as those lower risk, lower impact type projects uh, are fast tracked. And uh, with that being that there is a site visit that accompanies that particular process, uh, the application fee is $500 to account for the additional time and uh, effort that the department puts into uh, uh, reviewing that uh, project proposal. In terms of the registrable projects, there are a number of projects that are not eligible for registration. Uh, any projects that uh, you know satisfy any of those bullets on the screen uh, would automatically trigger the licensing project. So projects that cannot be registered if they result in the loss or alteration of a class three, four or five wetland, and that's using the uh, Stewart and Cantrude uh, wetland classification system. Uh, the project is proposed to drain a class six or seven soil or an unimproved organic soil. That's using the Canada land inventory for ag capability. Instances where the project is going to result in transfer of water between watersheds. Instances where the project is going to result in negative impacts on fish spawning rearing or passage and uh, just a uh, point of clarification this situation would automatically trigger licensing under the environment act licensing process instances if the project is inconsistent with an approved watershed plan or instances if it results in a violation of conservation agreement restrictions So one of the other new approaches that was added uh, is the no net loss of wetland benefits approach uh, that requires compensation for the loss or alteration of prescribed wetlands. The regulation uh, further describes steps achieving no net loss uh, for these uh, wetland benefits. The amount of offset that is required will vary depending on the type of restoration or enhancement work being done. The mitigation approach is based on a hierarchy of avoidance, minimization, and as a last resort, compensation. Project proponents are required to demonstrate steps that they will take to mitigate the loss of wetland benefits. Uh, these proponents are required to demonstrate their use of that mitigation process, uh, including how all options to avoid and or minimize impacts to the wetland have been considered. So this would be things like avoidance by using alternative sites to locate the project, minimizing wetland loss through design, construction and operational techniques. And then finally, as a last resort, compensation uh, could be considered uh, in those instances. So the Water Rights Act outlines compensation requirements for prescribed wetlands. The regulation itself outlines that class three or seasonal wetlands will require compensation in order to obtain a license to drain or alter them. Prior to the legislative amendment, uh, class three or seasonal wetlands could be altered without compensation. So our previous policy uh, does continue and uh, continues to not allow for drainage of class four and class five wetlands unless there are exceptional circumstances in instances where the project will provide significant benefit to society as a whole and the impacts to the wetlands are unavoidable. Such instances include highway construction, hydroelectric transmission lines and flood infrastructure projects. So really the, the takeaway on this particular slide is that the important change in the amended regulation is that the loss or alteration of class three wetlands uh, is, is if the uh, compensation measures are met previously, there was no requirement for compensation. In terms of the delivery approach, uh, this slide characterizes three distinct parties uh, that are envisioned in the implementation of this uh, concept. Uh, 
this includes conservation and climate, a payment agency or a banker to receive wetland compensation funds, as well as a delivery agency who can receive funds through a competitive bidding process to undertake wetland compensation projects to ensure the intended goal of no net loss of wetland benefits occurs. So in terms of roles of conservation and climate, uh, their function is to administer the act, the regulation uh, policies and processes, implement the no net loss of wetlands benefits principles, be involved in conducting wetland assessments, licensing decisions, development of educational materials, as well as uh, a reporting function. A uh, payment agency, or as we sometimes like to refer to it as a banker, uh, receives and manages wetland compensation funds as responsible for developing a tracking system to implement an RFP process to be able to award any compensation funds that have been collected back out to any delivery agencies. And the banker would also be responsible for monitoring and auditing compensation delivery programs and, and reporting back to conservation and climate. Delivery agencies, those are really the groups that are involved in, in getting projects put out on the landscape. Uh, they would deliver the wetland compensation and wet restoration projects, be involved in monitoring as well as follow up and a number of potential agencies that we would envision being uh, involved in this uh, would be uh, conservation agencies like Ducks Unlimited Canada, Nature Conservancy of Canada, uh, the host of watershed districts throughout the province, as well as the Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation. I'm sure there's many, many others that uh, might like to be involved as well. The presence or absence of water does not determine the class of a wetland. Most wetlands do go dry occasionally, and the absence of water does not necessarily mean that the area is no longer a wetland or that the class of the wetland has changed. The Stewart and Cantred Marsh classification system is the standard used in administering the Water Rights Act and is used extensively throughout the Northern Great Plains. The Stewart and Cantred system in identifies five uh, classes of wetlands. The class is determined by the length of time that the wetland holds surface water throughout the year, uh, assuming that year of average moisture conditions, as well as the associated vegetation and soils found within those areas. So in order to assist applicants with determining their wetland classification, and to determine the process that they need to use, either the registration or the licensing process. Uh, we had worked on developing wetland classification key uh, that has been uh, produced and is available on our website. Uh, based on feedback that we had received from the steering committee that was involved in regulation development, the document uses numerous photos to assist applicants with determining their wetland classification and to assist through that process. So next, talking a little bit about mitigation ratios. In order to achieve a no net loss of wetland benefits, the wetland compensation scheme needs to account for the gap between removing or altering a wetland and its benefits to when those benefits reestablish through restoration of another wetland. So specifically why we were looking at ratios, this provides a qualitative approach to determine compensation. It begins to account for the lag time or potential risk of failure with uh, projects. Looks to account for functional losses of restored areas versus the original habitat. Also accounts for losses as a result of less desirable locations that may be selected. And one of the other things that it does is it does deter undesirable land use decisions and habitat alterations from occurring in the first place. Compensation ratios are widely used internationally for a variety of habitat compensation applications. Specific compensation programs uh, reviewed in, the, in this particular context included the US Army Corps of Engineers, Alberta's Wetland Policy, 
and the approach uh, used by uh, Manitoba Infrastructure as well as Manitoba Hydro. And I would also note that uh, ratios are also used in the Boreal Wetland Policy recently announced by Agriculture and Resource Development. Bottom line is the use of ratios themselves provide that qualitative approach to determine the amount of compensation needed to offset wetland benefit losses. So there are essentially four methods of compensation uh, which fall under the definition of restoration and enhancement. So these four methods include restoration of a previous existing class three, four or five wetland. Enhancement projects would include increasing the size of a class three, four or five wetland, improving the benefits associated with a wetland, including upland habitat, and providing permanent legal protection of the improvement and providing permanent legal protection of the class one or two wetland. Compensation ratios for each method of compensation are based on surface area of the impacted wetland and include restoration and enhancement of existing wetlands at a two to one ratio, whereas enhancement of an existing wetland, including its upland habitat, and permanent legal protection of an existing wetland is at a, a three to one ratio. So looking at specifically at the mitigation process itself, if a project will result in the loss or alteration of a class three wetland, um, the process will unfold as follows. Uh, the applicant will seek a license to drain a prescribed wetland. The water resource officer will inspect the wetland to confirm the size as well as the classification. And then the landowner is able to choose uh, once they've gone through the comp or through the avoidance and mitigation steps, uh, can choose from uh, three compensation options. So the first is pay, second is purchase, and the third is perform would note that the landowner always has the option to not proceed with the project and to leave the wetland in place. In terms of compensation options, so this is looking at that first category, the pay option. Uh, compensation payments will be paid to the banker uh, to receive those compensation uh, fun or restoration funds. Um, the conservation organizations that are acting as approved service delivery agencies are able to then seek funding um, from those payments collected to conduct work on the landscape. In this particular example, uh, impacting a two acre class three wetland would require a $24,000 payment uh, made to the banker. This is calculated by multiplying the size of the wetland in acres multiplied by a ratio of two, which corresponds to restoring or enlarging an existing wetland multiplied by a figure of $6,000 per acre. So how was the $6,000 figure established and settled upon? Uh, we looked as uh, part of developing the process, uh, conducting a jurisdictional review, looking at numbers that were used elsewhere in North America we recognize that there were significant costs associated with the restoration, enhancement and preservation of these projects, uh, knowing that uh, these costs themselves need to be fairly assessed and, and fully recovered uh, from the proponent in order to meet our overall objective of no net loss. And at the end of the day, uh, we, we settled upon that figure of $6,000 per acre as making sense for, for Manitoba conditions, looking what other, other parties were doing. Obviously, some were higher and, and some were lower, but uh, that was the, the amount that was, uh, was selected. Components of restoration costs include land securement, land capital costs, as well as construction, operation and maintenance, ongoing monitoring, program oversight and reporting, as well as some dollars for legal counsel and contingency. The next option is to purchase a project. Uh, 
this is uh, an option where the applicant may choose uh, to use a negotiated price as opposed to that fixed $6,000 per acre. In this particular instance, the surface area of the restored or enhanced wetlands must also correspond with the applicable compensation ratio. So looking at the example in the bottom right, uh, we have a two acre class three wetland uh, service provider would be able to restore a four acre wetland uh, and between the two parties would be able to negotiate that price. Obviously, if uh, this was the compensation option that was selected, it would that negotiated price itself would need to be at a reduced amount uh, as compared to what that payment option that we previously discussed would be. Uh, this option was added following the consultation process that Andrea described to address market concerns if the wetland restoration or enhancement project could be completed more economically than the pay option. So the third option is the perform or what we like to refer to as the do it yourself option. That is where the applicant would perform the wetland restoration or enhancement project themselves. The caveat with this option is that the work needs to be completed prior to receiving their license to alter the seasonal wetland. So this is an important distinction between the previous two options of pay and purchase and ensures that the no net loss for wetland benefits policy is upheld. The surface area of restored or enhanced wetlands must correspond with the applicable compensation ratios that we uh, walked through previously. And following the officer inspection of the wetland uh, undergoing loss or alteration, the applicant must submit a written proposal that specifies the wetland compensation actions to be undertaken. So in this particular example of a two acre class three wetland, the proponent can enhance and protect six acres of wetland and upland habitat on their own property. You will recall that the protection of wetland, upland habitat surrounding a wetland uses that three to one ratio. Uh, so that's why we ended up with the uh, six acres in this particular example. So the question is, what if the applicant disagrees with the assessment conducted by the department? So firstly, the decisions reviewed uh, by the or of the water resource officer are reviewed by the senior officer to ensure concurrence with that assessment uh, decision. If an applicant uh, is not satisfied with that assessment decision, uh, they may choose to retain the services of a qualified individual uh, to reassess the wetland at their own cost. Uh, in the event that this third party assessment is completed, the department uh, would review the report, uh, would determine if any additional information was provided through that report that would overturn the previous decision. And, and ultimately, there is an appeal uh, process outlined in the Water Rights Act um, that the applicant may choose to use the appeal mechanism as outlined through the municipal board. At this point, I will turn things back over to Andrea to finish up. I think you're on mute, Andrea. Sorry. Can you hear me okay now? It's working good now. My phone is going off and the dog is barking, so great timing. Um, so in Manitoba, there are a number of water managers. Uh, the province has a role in, in management of infrastructure and um, water, provincial waterways. There was some of the responsibility was passed on to some watershed districts. So there are four districts that manage infrastructure as well. Local government has a role to play in water management, local water management. And then there's also private interests and uh, environmental non-governmental agencies. So there was there is a need for shared governance model for watershed management. And that's really the watershed district programs. 
So a watershed district is a partnership between a municipal or municipalities and provincial government to work together through local boards to manage water and land resources in a sustainable manner through locally delivered programs, outreach and education. The key principles of the watershed district program include shared a shared governance and funding model. So boards are made up of local representatives appointed by a member of municipalities and one provincial representative. Core funding comes from the province uh, and local municipalities. Another pr uh, principle is that there is locally led decision making, meaning they are ideally situated to respond to and address local issues in a manner which makes the most sense uh, locally. Watershed districts provide incentive based programming and they are not regulatory in any way. So the partnerships themselves rely on or the districts rely on partnerships to get work done. Um, and typically partner a lot with non-government agencies, government um, agencies as well, and really look to maximize the work they do on the landscape. Watershed districts value and support uh, expertise. So the science and technical information they get from local experts or um, government or NGO experts. Um, the local input they get from their municipalities and residents and uh, partnerships with First Nations or Indigenous communities. As well as uh, just historical knowledge of the area. So in addition to that, another principle of the Watershed District program is community engagement and watershed awareness. So there are 14 watershed districts across Manitoba. So this is a sample of program funding in 2018-19. Um, there are 14 watershed districts across the province. There's a provincial grant of $5.3 million. This was increased this year actually. And municipalities within the program are required to meet that at a three to one basis. So that means for every $3 the province provides, the the partnering municipalities must provide at minimum $1 in match. In addition to that, the watershed districts can uh, seek other funding sources. Um, and it's probably, or it's estimated this year that this total program fun funding will double because of those three, the establishment of those three uh, trusts that I'll talk about shortly. So, the watershed districts also um, are responsible for watershed management planning. So the watershed manage integrated watershed management planning process in Manitoba is led by watershed districts. And they're enabled under the Water Protection Act. So that authorizes the development of IWMPs by the these local water planning authorities, which are watershed districts. Again, watershed management planning is a cooperative process. All levels of including all levels of government, government, indigenous communities, stakeholders and residents that come together for the protection, restoration and improvement of. Of managed, sorry, improved management of water, aquatic ecosystems and drinking water sources within the watershed. The purpose of an IWMP is again to bring all these stakeholders together to develop a shared vision and common goals for the watershed, to collect and communicate information about the state of the watershed, to develop a shared implementation strategy that creates a framework for decision making, fosters partnerships and coordinates the action on the ground. And the end result of these uh, are really a shared action or implementation plan, which includes the common goals and priorities that tend to arise to the top of the local planning process. And each goal and objective lists an action item that can can be undertaken by all stakeholders that manage uh, land, water and other resources in the watersheds. So in addition to that, um, David mentioned under the registerable process that there 
there are ways that we can now link this watershed management planning process to the Water Rights Act, which weren't previously there. So uh, this is a bit of an outdated map. We now have 29 plans initiated across the province. Um, there are two watershed plans that are uh, under renewal um, and a new planning process down in the just below the Boy Morris watershed area. So working our way to covering most of southern Manitoba in watershed management plans and getting to the point where we're starting to renew some of the older plans. None, no plan is the same in Manitoba. Each plan um, takes on a different issue or pushes the boundaries a bit more. Uh, so we call it more of an evolutionary planning process um, for watershed management plans. So I'll shift over to grow or growing outcomes in watersheds. So uh, through that mandate provided by the Premier of developing an LS type program, Manitoba's response was to develop the GROW program. So even though the province of Manitoba is uh, leading the development of the program, there are a number of players um, that have led to the success of where we're at today with having the, the program out. So provincial co coordination um, with uh, locally endorsed uh, GROW programs, those programs are delivered by watershed districts. They establish a local growth committee and local priorities um, on what they will be delivering uh, through GROW. Agriculture and resource development is the main department that's working on GROW. Uh, we work with watershed districts and then also uh, with the producer focus of GROW. Uh, it was a, um, a no-brainer, I guess. Um, so in addition to that, the, the three trusts that were established by Manitoba, there are potential funding sources for GROW, and those are offered through an administrative process through Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation. It's a producer-focused program, uh, so producers play a main role in delivering the ecological goods and services offered um, through GROW. And then also uh, there is a requirement uh, for the watershed districts locally to have their local grow committees um, mainly composed of producers. The principles of grow are that it's targeted and based on, on watershed priorities. So looking at watershed management plans, um, it's locally delivered by watershed districts and producer focused. It has to be sustainable, measurable, uh, partnership based and is voluntary. So I've mentioned the funding piece uh, quite a bit, but in 2018, the Manitoba govern government threw a significant $104 million endowment to the Winnipeg Foundation, uh, established the Conservation Trust. So this is, at least in Manitoba, unheard of at the time. Um, in 2019, the Manitoba government provided another $52 million investment, and that was to establish the GROW Trust. And that specifically focused on funding pro GROW projects, uh, including incentive payments to producers to, to provide ecological goods and services. And then in order to balance um, the streamlined approach for drainage of class one and two wetlands, in 2020, Manitoba established the Wetlands Grow Trust uh, to provide funding to producers willing to conserve class one and two wetlands and enhance and restore other wetlands as well. So the interest generated from these three trusts is administered by Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation. Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation has been instrumental in su supporting Manitoba in building the funding framework for GROW. The interest generated from these trusts this year is estimated to be approximately $9 million. Um, and this will be available in perpetuity, uh, dependent on markets and investments. 
In 2020, Manitoba, Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation and the Winnipeg Foundation announced approximately $5 million in funding to watershed districts for their delivery of grow. So in addition to this funding source, uh, like I mentioned before, watershed districts have core uh, funding provided through that provincial municipal partnership. Um, in addition to that, there's Ag Action Manitoba Assurance um, watersheds ecological goods and services stream and that's available just to watershed districts to deliver ecological goods and services programs um, and then in addition to that they can apply to federal sources municipal sources and other types of funding sources the objectives of grow are to deliver ecological goods and services in manitoba um, that improve watershed health and resiliency and improve water quality. Some co-benefits of GROW include on-farm water management, sustainable agricultural production, improved biodiversity and habitat, and enhanced carbon storage. So GROW is delivered locally by watershed districts. They are able to apply to that uh, trust, those three trusts to seek funding to deliver grow. Um, the program is designed to be a targeted approach. So watershed districts have to ensure that their local program is consistent with their watershed management plan. Um, grow can provide incremental and existing environmental benefits. So there is a recognition that there are producers on the landscape that have not or have not done the wrong thing. And so they can be recognized for doing doing the right thing. Um, it's also aligned with environmental the environmental farm plan program. So producers participating in grow are encouraged to have their environment environmental farm plan. And the focus, of course, is on agricultural lands in Manitoba watersheds. So how is GROW different? So typical watershed district uh, incentive-based program focuses on providing incentives for implementation costs. This includes technical studies, construction costs, materials, and project management. GROW differs because it offers the ability for watershed districts to work with landowners to recognize um, through an annual incentive payment the ecological goods and services that they're delivering. So through this, landowners are required to um, sign landowner contracts agreeing to certain terms, short term um, agreements. There can be an in annual incentive, but that depends on the, the impact of the project that the district is working with the producer on. So if it impacts their operation um, and their bottom line, then there's likely going to be an incentive payment. And if not, then probably not an incentive payment. And these incentive payments are really determined locally within provincial parameters um, and guidelines. So some of the activities supported by GROW include water retention, so permanent or temporary storage designed to reduce peak flows and mitigate for flooding. Um, wetland conservation, restoration and enhancement, riparian area conservation, um, preservation and enhancement, um, buffer strip establishment, so looking at riparian buffers or eco buffers, um, shelter belts, upland areas, so improving grasslands, woodlots and soil health improvements, and then a final category of in innovative approaches and this is really designed recognizing that science and beneficial management practices on the landscape are, are evolving um, so there's an ability for districts to explore new opportunities to to get this so i'll go into the wetland category specifically um, so really the focus here is conservation enhancement and restoration of wetlands. One of the, the balanced approach uh, when we talk about balancing regulation and incentives is really the ability for producers to now use GROW to um, 
seek an annual payment on a class one or two wetland um, within uh, annual crop field. So it focuses on these private lands, class one and two wetlands and um, annual cropland. So producers would enter into an agreement agreeing just to not drain it. Uh, drain these ones and twos, recognizing they can be drained through that streamlined approach now. Um, the producers can still farm through these. Um, it's just a commitment to um, not drain. However, if a producer wanted to enter into a further agreement to not farm through it, then that annual incentive payment would be tailored as such. So in addition to that, there's enhancement of existing wetlands of any class. And again, these are focused on private private lands and designed to improve wetland benefits. So Manic or the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture is working uh, with native plant solutions to help uh, inform um, Manitoba on some of these enhancement approaches that would, would improve wetland benefits on the landscape. So we're pretty excited about that work. And then finally, the restoration of drained or degraded wetlands on private lands. I think we can take questions. If everybody's still awake. Um, thank you, Andrea and Dave. Um, I will go ahead and uh, please type any questions you might have or um, Dave, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, just yeah. turn uh, unmute your mic and go ahead. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yep. Um, I got a question about uh, what the provincial role is in monitoring, or is this all, all the monitoring of effectiveness, for instance, of the wetland conservation policies? Is that left to the wetland districts? It, it's really sort of a, a partnership uh, with those that are involved in doing the work, but there's also a provincial oversight requirement where the province would be uh, playing a, a lead role as well in uh, in that type of work. All right, uh, we do have another question that just came in. What has been farmer feedback so far on the cost and options for identifying and draining class three wetlands? I would say that, you know, the response to the date has been quite varied. Um, you know, some it, it's really very when we did the consultation, it was a very sort of polarizing response uh, from all sectors, uh, including the ag sector. Uh, specifically on the ag sector, you know, some, you know, thought it was quite fair. Others thought it was uh, too expensive. Uh, we even had some saying that, oh, we thought we'd have to pay a lot more. So it, it's really all over the board in, in terms of the response that we've received thus far. Okay, uh, next question. Do you only recognize uh, mineral wetlands? Uh, does the policy apply to peatlands? If not, how do you address peatlands? So really, it's there was also the boreal strategy as well, uh, and and the two were really meant to sort of dovetail together. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the two uh, to ensure that uh, you know all types of wetlands are are captured uh, throughout the province, whether they're they're mineral or uh, or organic. Right. Uh, uh, Dave, did you still have a question or is your, your hand just still up? Okay, great. Hi, uh, how is everything enforced? How do you deal with illegal drainage? So on the, on the enforcement side of things, uh, we do receive a, a lot of complaints, uh, which we will, you know, use uh, as a bit of a starting point. Uh, certainly, officers, when they're going out, uh, they have the opportunity to observe things as well. 
Um, so there's that aspect as well in terms of picking up instances of illegal drainage or unauthorized works that are being conducted. Uh, it's really meant that we, we have to be able to collect adequate information to be able to proceed with uh, laying charges or whatever sort of enforcement tools we, we choose to, to use. Um, but, but those would be sort of the primary ways that uh, we would go about uh, working through a, a complaint. Uh, we, we do have a standardized complaint form that we will circulate to individuals. Uh, the, the purpose of that is really to collect as much information as possible from the individual bringing something to our attention. Um, so that we would be able to, uh, you know, hit the ground running, so to speak, uh, have that baseline information rather than, you know, some of the vague uh, complaints that we would receive saying that, you know, there's an issue at the northwest corner of the municipality and, and not necessarily having a lot of details to be able to assist with. So that's, that's the reason why we uh, ended up uh, going down that road in terms of asking the individual to uh, put that additional information down in writing for us to use as a starting point. Okay, uh, we have another question. How was the three to one ratio for a farmer to replace a class three wetland? The example given as a two acre class three where a farmer would have to create six acre class three before removing the two acre class three. Sorry, so the question was how was the three to one selected? I. Uh, uh, yeah, is, I believe so. Is that yeah. okay? Um, so I, I guess you know, as part of looking at what other jurisdictions were doing, uh, you know, we found ratios that were used that were all over the board, um, and sort of working back and forth, and you know, looking at sort of a Manitoba context. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we felt uh, would work best uh, in Manitoba. But but certainly, you know, there was all kinds of other options that could uh, potentially have been selected as well. Uh, are those ratios and prices the same for a class two and a class five, for example? So in terms of class two, there's no compensation required for class two wetlands. The, the compensation that we were talking about uh, was for seasonal or class three wetlands. Uh, in instances where there was a class five wetland that was going to be impacted, uh, those would only be in exceptional circumstances, those types of situations that I'd referenced. And there's nothing prescribed in terms of the process for those. Uh, rather, those would be handled as sort of one-off uh, type situations with the uh, individual that would be responsible. Okay, uh, here's another question. Can the uh, farmer himself identify a class, the class of wetland, or does it, he always have to bring in the provincial officer? This must be especially an issue in deciding between class two and three. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that's the reason why we put together, one of the reasons why we put together that wetland classification guide is, is because uh, the landowner needs to um, have a pretty good idea in terms of whether or not it's a class two, which would enable them to move through that registration process, or if it was class three and they were seeking a license and require them to provide compensation for the project. So we ask individuals to take sort of a first cut at uh, describing and, and assessing, you know, the wetland on their own property. Um, and then once the application is submitted, uh, the officer would conduct a, a site inspection. Uh, if they agree with that assessment, uh, it would sort of move through as the applicant had uh, sort of identified the, uh, the application stream. In instances where they've applied for a registration, and uh, so they th the farmer thinks that it's a class two, but it happens to be a class three, we would then be able to convert that to the license application process um, so that they, they would still be able to uh, retain, uh, you know, the $100 application that they have uh, provided. Uh, and then they would just uh, simply uh, pay the difference, the $400 to be able to satisfy the $500 application fee. Okay, great. And uh, let's see. is there going to be 
just recently in the news, there's been uh, uh, information coming out that Manitoba, Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation is going to go from a crown corporation to a nonprofit. Is it is there going to be any difference in the operation with the change? I can't Hi, speak to the specifics here. Can you take that, Andrea? I can try. I, I can't speak to the specifics, um, but I believe that they're providing a presentation sometime this month that would talk about the, the major changes to them. I'm not sure if anybody on the line from MHHC is, is here that could answer too. This is John Patterson Williams speaking. Um, there is a webinar on the 24th of February that I sent an invite out to all of you that are on the mailing list. So I would encourage you to attend that for more information. OK, uh, perfect. It doesn't look like there are any more questions coming in. I'd like to take this up. Oh, there's a couple more. Uh, how long does it take on average uh, from a request to assess, to assess a wetland? That's largely going to be dependent on the time of year that we receive the application. Um, you know, if it happens to be uh, seasonal that we're able to get out on site, uh, we do uh, endeavor to process these as, as quickly as possible. Uh, sometimes due to resources and, and whatnot, uh, it may take a little bit of additional time, especially if that site visit is required. Um, but we, we have set sort of an overall uh, target for issuance of uh, Water Control Works licenses of about six weeks. Uh, so certainly, you know, in the vast majority of instances, we are able to turn it around within that period outside uh, of the, uh, the winter periods. OK, uh, another part of the question is, do you have a specific group of officers who conduct these assessments? Yeah, so each of our officers are, are trained in uh, doing wetland assessments. Um, we do have a map available on our web page that uh, you know, indicates who the uh, particular officer is. That can be used as, as a starting point. Uh, in order to just manage the flow of applications, uh, sometimes we will pull in an adjacent officer just due to workload to to be able to assist with that particular task. OK, uh, one more question. Under Grove, funding retention of existing class one and two wetlands is eligible funding. However, under the Conservation Trust, perpetual retention of wetland or grassland is not as grasslands is not eligible. Are there discussions around the potential changes of the eligibility in the future? Um, I, I think that that's more of a question for Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation. So through GROW, there is we we've as the province have used this as the incentive tool behind some of the it's, it's basically the carrot behind some of what David was talking in the stick realm. It's it's there to provide some incentive for producers to not use that streamlined approach to drain the class one and two wetlands specifically. Um, conservation eligibility or conservation trust eligibility, although some of that money is designed and earmarked for the implementation of GROW, um, we don't provincially set the framework for the conservation trust fund outside of GROW. So probably more of a question for Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation. I see there's another question from Howie about the pay and purchase options. Uh, so those are, are um, in the payment option, the funds would be paid to the banker and then the banker in turn would make arrangements uh, to secure a project. So it would not be happening on the producer's own land. Uh, that type of instance would be happening if they were doing using the do it yourself or the perform option. Uh, the purchase option that is going to be at another location where they've made uh, arrangements themselves on a negotiated price. <laughs> 
Great. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending today's presentation. I'd like to take this uh, uh, chance to thank Andrea and David for their great presentation today. Um, and we, we'll uh, see everybody uh, next month. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.